Welcome to our special coverage on COVID-19. You may be joining us on City FM 97.3 City TV or on our social media handles. My name is Fremer Dunyame. We are bringing you all the updates, the analysis, and also give you the opportunity to share your views with us. So you may have heard since morning that now we are in the 2000. I don't know if you should be worried, if you should be scared, or just relax. We are going to be getting the breakdown of what is happening and um, how our fight so far has been what the global figures are and so much more so don't go anywhere after this break I will be introducing my guest to you and we will have a conversation we'll be right back You welcome back. This is our special coverage on COVID-19. My name is Freeme Dunyame. My guest this afternoon, Bernard Avle. I don't like mentioning his middle name because you say I, I massacred the name. So <laughs> I'll just go with Bernard Avle. He's general manager of City FM and City TV and also host of City Breakfast Show and um, Point of View on City TV. Bernard, you're welcome. Thank you very much. So they say I should mention your middle name. <laughs> it's Koku. Koku. <laughs> It's not Koku, it's Koku. Oh, see, I'll learn it properly, don't worry. <laughs> and I also have here Kojo Akutubwating, is um, head of social, head of new media and research. Um, research, and also team member of the City Breakfast Show. Kojo, you're welcome. Thank you, Freema. Right, so let's go straight to what is happening. In fact, I've been waiting, you know, to just have the discussion this afternoon, looking at the figures. It is our highest jump we've had so far. Today, we have recorded 2,700, 2,074 cases, Kojo, 2,074 cases. Quite honestly, I didn't think that we would get to the 2,000. I thought the highest we probably will go is the 1,000, and then we'll see the curve coming down. But we just keep moving, moving, moving. What's happening? Well, if you look at the breakdown of the data as we have it, um, we are 2,074. Yeah. Um, because of the enhanced contact uh, tracing and the testing, we are seeing more cases. So in that particular category have about 1,250. Mm. So if you ask what's happening, um, the local cases and the enhanced contact tracing Do is giving us... we have the figures on the screen? Yeah, yeah, it's giving us more. So we are 2,074. Yeah. The total active cases are 1,845. The total recoveries are 202. And the total deaths are 17. Now if you check the original distribution, mm. the Greater Accra region has 1,795 cases. Mm -hmm. Now, Shanti region um, is next with 99 cases. And then you check the Eastern region, which is third in the, in the ranking, 70 cases. Mm -hmm. Central, 21 cases. Upper East, 19. Uti, 19. Volta, 16. Northern region, 13. Upper West, 10. Western region, 9. Um, northeast region two, western north one. So far, Savannah, Bono, Bono East, and Ahafo have not recorded any cases. Yeah. So um, they don't have any cases. So that's generally how the Ghana situation is. And if you check this breakdown, those from the general surveillance, um, 109, right? Mm -hmm. so and 17 have died. Now the mandatory quarantine, the Accra and Tamale, we still have a total of 115. We have no record of people being discharged, critically ill or dead in that particular group. And the enhanced contact tracing, 1,250. Mm -hmm. So all that brings us to the 2,074 mm -hmm. that we've recorded so far for the Republic of Ghana when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. Right, Bernard, so the 2,074, you know, when you're breaking them down, we earlier heard of the backlog, so we kind of felt that um, once we are dealt with that, if we are really being able to handle community transfers, we weren't supposed to be recording these high figures. So are we still, I don't know if you can give me that answer, but are we still looking at the backlog that we had, clearing that all we are recording? Uh, 
recording new cases every day. What's really going on? So what we know is the three main sources of infections based on the three characterizations the Ghana Health Service has given. Mm -hmm. They call something general or routine surveillance, which initially meant if somebody presents at a hospital with the symptoms, you either detain the person, you trace their contacts, you test them. So that's what we're doing before we decided to close our border. Yeah. Then there's something we call the mandatory quarantine group. And then there's something we call enhanced contact tracing, which yeah. started about three weeks from the first case. Mm -hmm. Now, so the question you're asking is, how come we're having new cases? Is it because the backlog is bringing new positives? Yeah. That's possible. But the question you should, to, call to, to, to make your question better, you can look at where is the growth coming from? Yeah. The growth is split between the routine or general surveillance, mm -hmm. which is people who are not feeling well, they go to hospital, we trace who they met, versus the enhanced contact tracing. Mm -hmm. for, for the past one month, the travelers and a mandatory quarantine, the figure has remained 115. Yeah. So that hasn't changed. Now let me just show you something quickly. Before we got to 2074, we were at 1,671. Yeah. Of those cases, 543 were from the general surveillance. Mm -hmm. 1,013 was from enhanced contact tracing. 115 was from the people who were mandatorily quarantined. So 500 and something general mm -hmm. surveillance. Yeah. 1,013 enhanced contact tracing. But look at the tests that are producing these cases. The routine surveillance, 543. Mm -hmm. The test conducted to get that figure was 22,054. Mm -hmm. So 22,000 tests, 543 are positive. The enhanced contact tracing, you have done 82,000 tests. So that's four times the 22,000. Yeah. And your figure is just double. Mm -hmm. So just look at the equation again. For your routine surveillance, you, you test 22,000 people, 500 are positive. Yeah. For your enhanced contact tracing, your test number is four times. Mm -hmm. That's 82,000, but your positives are 1,000. That's double of the 500. So what am I saying? Your routine surveillance, your original method of testing yeah. is producing more positives per test mm -hmm. than your enhanced contact tracing. That still means that our the tests we do for people who present the symptoms and whose contacts we trace, those tests are more accurate in terms of the contact trace than our enhanced contact tracing. Okay. So the enhanced contact tracing, the positivity rate mm -hmm. is 1.2%, okay. but the routine surveillance is 2.5%. So that's point one. Mm -hmm. Point number two, jumping from 1,006 to, six, uh, to, to 2,000, where did the increase come from? For routine surveillance, we had 543 cases yeah. now for now it's moved to 709 so that's 160 people yeah okay for enhanced contact tracing we're around 1013 and it's jumped to 1250 so that's another 200 people yeah. are you following my, my logic so that's second issue so it yeah. tells me that the general routine surveillance is more is helping us get more people than the Enhanced contact tracing. So should we stop that, you know, wasting no. resources? No. These 1,250 people, if we hadn't done enhanced contact tracing, we wouldn't have found them. Mm -hmm. But what makes this very interesting is that if you go to the routine surveillance, all those who have recovered are coming from those that group. Mm -hmm. All those who are dying are coming from that group. Yeah. Why? Because we started that earlier. And also because that surveillance is based on symptoms. Mm -hmm. Not just somebody saying, I met somebody and yeah. went somewhere. So if you look at the number of people who have died, all the 17 have come from the 26,000 people we tested on a routine surveillance. Yeah. Don't forget, we jumped from 22,000 to 26,000 mm -hmm. for routine. All those who have recovered have come from that group. All those who have died have come from that group. All those who are moderately ill have come from that group. All those who have been quarantined mandatorily, 115, Nobody has died, but nobody has recovered. Mm -hmm. All those we've gotten from enhanced contact tracing, nobody has died, nobody has recovered. All those we got from these two groups, nobody is critically ill. Yeah. What does it say? It suggests that a lot of the people within the 
mandatory quarantine and enhanced contact tracing are asymptomatic. They are not even falling sick. Mm -hmm. It tells you that our general surveillance is where we are going to actually get the key people that we need in terms of the real situation with those who are sick. Mm -hmm. But you need to add the enhanced contact tracing to get a bigger view of the general population. Mm. So if you ask me whether I should be worried, I can only answer that question if I am told when the tests were done. Yeah. If the tests were done three days ago, I'll be very worried. If the samples that have brought these 400 cases were taken over a one-month period, I wouldn't be too worried. Yeah. But it can be worrying if the people whose samples were taken are not in quarantine. Exactly. Do you understand my logic? Yeah, yeah, so if yeah. these samples were taken only three days ago, it means that, they, don't forget, I always tell you that to deal with, to know whether we are going up or down, you are looking at the new infections. It's called the infection rate. Mm -hmm. Not the number of who have tested positive. Yeah. Because it's an, you, you always need to look at how many people, so you, you are looking at incidence, not prevalence. Yeah. Okay, now I'll come back to explain that. So. If I knew the time the samples were taken, mm -hmm. but if the samples were taken only last week, then I'll say, Freema, we haven't reached the top of our curve yet. Mm. The frustration is that we don't know when the samples were taken. Yeah. We don't know what order they are testing the samples. But what I can say is that our general surveillance or routine surveillance is proving to be giving us a more realistic view of the at-risk population mm -hmm. yeah. than their total. So if you take, for example, what the website has written, positivity rate of 1.83 in Ghana, they break it down to routine surveillance 2.71, mm -hmm. mandatory contact tracing 1.4, sorry, mandatory quarantine 5.6, and then contact tracing 1.47. My point is that the 2.71, in my view, is more useful than the 1.47 yeah. because that's over a longer period of time. It gives us a better understanding of the disease behavior because you have people who have been sick for a longer period, and that's the group that has a recovery, the critically ill, and the dead. Mm -hmm. So far, the mandatory quarantine and enhanced contact tracing have not gone through the cycle yet, so I can't really know the usefulness of that data set mm -hmm. yet. So I don't know whether you should be worried or not. That's my <laughs> long answer to your short question. Well, we all don't know how we should be feeling because the way information is coming in is not scheduled properly. So we don't, like Benna said, we don't know when samples were taken and all. But if you look at when we started testing and when figures come in, started coming in, and the recovery rate, do they really match? Because we are always adding on to the figures and we are told that we have just, we've not even had 10 people in critical condition so far. But we are not also seeing a lot of people Let me recovering. Go, we've not had 10 people in critical condition at, at the time. same time. Yes. So that could be the way they are putting the data out because mm -hmm. we haven't been told, you, there isn't a place you can go where they say critical condition means A, severe fever, difficulty in breathing. Mm -hmm. Need All they've said is uh, critical stroke, moderately ill. Yeah. I'm not a doctor, but if you use English language and I tell my son somebody is critically ill and I say somebody is moderately ill, in English language that doesn't mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Moderately ill means that it's average it's or above. Bad. Critical yeah. means it's near death. So why for a public health pandemic you put critical and moderate in the same paragraph? I don't understand. Yeah. But I didn't go to enough school so I can't tell. <laughs> we are, you, you, you say uh, that of 2000 839 are well and responding to treatment in facility mm -hmm. stroke at home. Yeah. Only six are critically or moderately ill yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there has been no point in time where the people who are critically ill have been more than five. Yes. That could mean that some people within the well stroke responding to treatment deteriorate and come to the critically ill. Mm -hmm. Or some people who, don't forget, this is the first time they've done an autopsy of the death. So it's possible that somebody could have even died from COVID. ill, but has added to the death. Yeah. The whole thing about this thing is that the clearer the information, the more consistent it is, the more meaning you can make out of mm -hmm. it. You can use statistics to do anything. Yeah. So if you want a population to behave in a certain way based on numbers, they have to understand what the numbers mean. Mm -hmm. Which is why you are here saying, ah, Charlie, 403 people. Hey, I ask them more. 
I can't even tell you what that means. Yeah. If I go to a press briefing and I ask, what does the 403 mean? Oh, there was a backlog. They don't tell us when the backlog was taken. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's really helpful to just have the big numbers. Oh, 2074, 202, uh, 17. Those three numbers are important globally because mm -hmm. that's what determines the prevalence yeah. rate, right? Which is key. But if the nuances of which group the samples came from, which one is growing at which rate, and those things are not brought in, for public education it becomes a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Th that's why I'm very hesitant to give you a definite answer. So there was supposed to be a press conference this morning. It was called off, and we don't know why. This was one of the questions our team was going to ask. So when we get the chance, we're going to ask that, mm -hmm. okay, where is our rate of infection? Yeah. What is the rate of new infections? How do you explain the 403? Should we be alarmed or should we be happy? Mm -hmm. So for me, there are lots of questions to be answered about what this data means. Maybe Kojo can help. Well, Bernard has said everything. It's, it's the same thing we've been thinking about and the same thing we've been wondering. For example, the last time we had figures and we were at 1671, we were told we had done a little over 100,000 tests. Yeah. Now we have done 113,000 tests and we have 400 and a little over 400 new cases. But there's no proper breakdown to let us know whether these are new cases, whether these are from the backlog of cases, and when the tests were done, and when the, the, the results were obtained. So it leaves us to, there's an information vacuum that cannot help you to make proper conclusions and inferences to understand where we are going with this. Whether we are managing a backlog of cases or whether we are seeing new positives, All right? And if you look at the data that we've been seeing from the regions, we saw what the Eastern region sent earlier when the porn cases came. We've seen some information that has been uh, leaked into the media, the situation, uh, the, the, situers, mm. the situational reports, and realize that in those reports, there's a bit more data and clarity. But I don't understand why when it comes to informing the nation, that breakdown is not given to us, that clarity is not given to us for us to understand what is happening. Mm -hmm. So you'll be there and new data will be floated on the platform. For example, if you check the Ghana Health Service website, today's date is the 30th mm -hmm. of April 2020, yeah. right? Now, the information we got about the 2,074 cases mm -hmm. was around today, 9.35 a.m., yeah. right? We are on air on the City Breakfast Show yeah, when I'm the information came. But if you check the website for the further and better particulars, the date on the chart as published is 28th April 2020. Mm -hmm. Table one. Let them put the table on the on the on the, on yeah, the screen, screen for us to see. Table one: confirmed COVID-19 cases and treatment outcomes. Mm -hmm. Ghana, 28th April 2020. Mm -hmm. And you put the figures together, and it's 2074. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, this announcement was made today. Yeah. Right. So the inconsistency in releasing the data and in making certain things clear leaves a lot of doubt and a lot of vacuum in the space for analysts and people who are watching the cases very closely to to make conclusions or to make inferences and i don't think this is how we want to manage the cases going forward mm -hmm. especially after we've crossed the 2000 mark yeah we are now at 2074 and these figures the 2074 was known to the ghana health service as at the 28th of april Prima, you get me? I do. And that is two days ago. Yeah, so, so, so is, it, is it difficult, you know, Bernard, I don't know, is it mm -hmm. difficult to just give us a daily update? So, for instance, if today we recorded no case, is it difficult to say that, so today, 30th April, zero case, maybe no, it's if because, there are... you see, it's because your testing, your, your test results, your test capacity is changing rapidly. So, for example, when we started, we had only Kolebu and KCCR. Yeah. Then we had... So we had Noguchi and cases here. Mm -hmm. Then we had the Kolebu Reference Lab. Now we have Ho. Tamale 2 is getting ready. So we don't have a set time that test results come in. Because the disease can only be diagnosed after a test result. It's mm -hmm. not like you are measuring cough in a country where mm -hmm. somebody coughs, goes to hospital, they just document that I'm coughing. Yeah. So your ability to know the number of people who have the disease or the virus is based on tests. I now, mm -hmm. so I, I get your question. Yeah. Why can't they give us a daily update? We don't so know. We don't record any or we don't get any results from any of the testing centers or if yeah. we get just two from maybe Noguchi, can't we put that Yeah, but you see, a test result does not mean a new case. Mm -hmm. 
until you clear your backlog and you have a specific window and say we will get test results every day but every day's test results will be cases we got from three days ago mm -hmm. you get me yeah. so if for example today there's a list of 100 test results that come mm -hmm. and we know that it came from last friday then we all know what to measure from that yeah. but because there isn't clarity in the public domain about how far how big the backlog is and how far back the samples were taken you cannot really know your daily rate do you follow me mm -hmm. and but okay let me help you what i can say confidently yeah. is that the prevalence rate of covid 19 is increasing mm -hmm. what is prevalence rate is the number of cases in a country the status or the existence of people with COVID-19 within the country now how do you calculate that you find out how, how many new cases are coming yeah. and then you remove from it how many people are recovering and dying mm -hmm. okay now in Ghana the people are not dying as quickly as other parts of the world which is great but that means that your you see your your incident cases now 403 new cases mm -hmm. you are removing those who have died yesterday or 16 is now 70 so one person has died recovered it was how many uh, 188 is now 212 yeah. so you have 24 recoveries one death so 25 people Up so the so if, if there's a bowl of prevalence you've added 403 into the bowl you've removed only 25 so your prevalence is going up yeah. now what does it mean your recovery must increase faster than your in so for example if you have a bowl of thousand cases you've just added 403 new cases based on today if the recoveries had jumped or grown faster than the new cases coming mm -hmm. then your prevalence is going down yeah. so, so uh, from what yeah. i'm saying your prevalence is not going down exactly. because yeah. people are not dying which is great but people are also not recovering as quickly so there are people you are adding to the bowl in of prevalence it's more but the, the other point is that prevalence is just one measure mm -hmm. of a disease uh bedding do you get, do you yeah. but what i can confidently say is that prevalence is going up because the rate of recovery and the rate of death is not as high as the new cases being added mm. could you i hope this makes yeah yeah, yeah you're making sense. Sense. And, and what i can say to yes. add to what bernard is saying is that it is not that the information is not available uh-huh what they are refusing to share it that's 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 my conclusion it is not that the information is not available the breakdowns as we need is not available because we see stuff we see documents right mm -hmm. and in some of the documents every question bernard is asking you see a proper breakdown for example they have charts that they have new suspected cases for the day new confirmed cases for the day new deaths for the day then they'll do the cumulative suspected cases cumulative cases and all those other parameters mm -hmm. which will give you a very good understanding of what the situation is so based on the information we've, we've seen mm -hmm. it's it's it points to the fact that we are collecting the data even the number of contact traced in a day mm -hmm. on the regional level at the district level they are collecting all that information which helps us to make decisions in managing the case in resource allocation and whatnot but they are not releasing the information and that is what i don't really understand why they don't want to break things down properly and release it properly for us. Look, go back to the Ghana Health Service website. Now, if you check their site, mm. even the gender balance of COVID-19 cases is not being updated. The gender balance of the COVID-19 cases. Mm -hmm. You go there and you see male 62, female 38. Yesterday I checked male 62, female 32. Then you put the mouse on the male and it gives you a figure of a count of 69. Meanwhile, as of yesterday, we are 1,671 cases. Yeah. So why isn't somebody sitting down to put all these figures together and put it out? Because what it does is, independent analysts who are also researching into COVID-19 pandemic to also think about solutions when they see the trends, would also think about solutions and also know what to do. Hmm. But nobody is doing that. So, you know, I, I come back to my earlier question, Bernard, hmm. that 
you are taking samples we keep taking samples you know um, under the enhanced contact tracing we are still going out there to get people and we are not able to test quickly we are not able to inform people of their status yesterday I was um, having a conversation with somebody who was in self um, quarantine and the person was telling me that the trauma you know that he has to go through ie am I going to be positive am I going to be negative why are we not clearing all these to give us a better no, but, but Freeman, I think we should also have a sense of perspective what what you said is true but it's going to change very soon because as I've said the test capacity of the country is changing very rapidly from Noguchi and KCC we now have mm -hmm. Kalibu mm -hmm. Lab Ho. we have Ho, Tamale is coming mm -hmm. that's number one. Number two if what INCAS and KNUST are doing for RD yeah, RDT comes on yeah. frame that is a game changer Yeah. okay so that's Yes, people should be concerned that they are not sure of how quickly results are coming in. If you compare our testing numbers with all our peers, we are with million. Our tests are much, much higher and better. So we always need that sense of perspective. Okay, number three, should you be worried? There are things you should be happy about. The percentage of the people who are critically sick is still very low. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the active cases, because we have 2,047, you take out those who have died. 74. Good. So your, your active cases, if you take the people who are critically sick as a percentage of your active cases, that's around 0.32%, mm. lower than the global average. Yeah. So for some reason, critically sick people in Ghana, as a percentage of the total population of people who are infected, is low. Mm. That is a source of comfort. Number two, your case fatality rate, which is defined as the percentage of people with a condition who die, yours is very low. In fact, based on the new numbers we have, it's gone down to 0 0.8. When, it was, when we had 1,671 cases, mm -hmm. our case fatality for 16 deaths was around 1%. Now we have 17 deaths, and now you have 2,040. 2,074. 74 cases. So that 17 as a percentage of that is around 0 0.8. Mm. Perspective, case fatality rate. 15.7% of people in UK who have coronavirus have died. Mm -hmm. That's a massive case fatality rate. Yeah. I'll jump Belgium. Belgium was the leader last time I came in. UK is number one, 15.7. Belgium number two, 15.7. France number three, 14.5. So if means if hundred people get it, this percent this number would die. Italy, thirteen point six. Netherlands, twelve point one. Now let me even show you worldwide. So as Bernard looks for that, yeah. if our uh, um, fatality rate was anywhere close to any of these countries, like the UKs, it means that by now we should see about three hundred people who have died in Ghana. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because our fatality rate is low, zero point eight. We are seeing seventeen people. Yeah. It means that even though we have a, a lot of people with the disease, only a few are dying. Mm. It could mean many things, which mm -hmm. the experts could explain to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could mean that our systems are able to support the treatment and ensure that people don't get critically ill to the point that they will die. Mm -hmm. It could mean that our immune systems are stronger and could fight this. Mm -hmm. It could mean many things, but the thing with science is that you do not make instantaneous diagnosis or instantaneous conclusions. They would have to collect a large data um, they, they would have to collect data yeah. over time and analyze that data and conduct further tests and ask further questions to know the reason why this is happening. But generally, compared to the UK, Belgium, and the other countries that Bernard is mentioning, mm. only a small percentage, a tiny percentage of the people who have had COVID-19 in Ghana have died, which shouldn't be something we should rejoice because e each life lost is very important. Is yeah. very important. Yeah. That's why we should all, even though our fatality rate is low, we should all ensure that we do not get it and, and, and put pressure on the system mm. or be a cause for worry that you could also die and add to the fatality, the numbers. So right. let's do the right things to stop the spread and to prevent this from. So I was going on. to give you some some figures since mm -hmm. I see you're a bit sad, so let me make you a bit. <laughs> Um, case, yes, case fatality yeah. Yeah. is also an important measure. See, the thing about this, uh, what COVID-19 is teaching us is that mm. there are so many nuances to how to interpret figures. Yeah. 
okay, testing capacity, percentage of critically ill who survive, percentage of, the pop of those who are sick or critically ill, case fatality rate, incidence, prevalence, your basic reproductive number, a lot of things to learn. Mm. I'm loving it. Now, let's talk about Africa. Algeria. Before we talk about Africa, okay. let's just take a quick break. So when we okay. come back, we'll be delving into Africa, and I'll also be finding out from you if we are, I mean, nearing our peak. And so very soon, we are going to be seeing <laughs> the care that issue. coming down. Okay. So I mean, these are things that people would want to know. So we'll be right back after this. out there. My name is Mahmoud Baumia, Vice President of the Republic. I would like to talk to you about the coronavirus pandemic that we are dealing with at the moment. It is a virus that has infected over 1.7 million people worldwide and over 107,000 people have died from it. It is a virus that is transmitted either through touching somebody, shaking their hands, uh, that they can transmit the virus if they are positive, or through sneezing, coughing, um, that can bring out droplets uh, which uh, can touch you. Uh, so this is how it is generally transmitted. And because of that, we have the science telling us that we should try and maintain distances between people, one meter to two meters of distances, so that the droplets will not be able to travel very far. It is therefore very important that we follow the instructions that have been given to all of us, minimize or don't shake anybody's hands. Welcome back. This is still our special coverage on COVID-19. My name is Premier Dunyame. My guest in the studio, Kujakutu Boateng and Bernard Avle. So currently, Ghana's case count for COVID-19 stands at 2,074, with 212 people recovering and 17 people dying. But so far, Bernard and Kujo are trying to tell us that we should put the figures in perspective and we should not be too worried. And so we were just about delving into how um, other African countries are doing and if we are supposed to compare our figures to them, how we are faring before the break. So Bernard, I actually didn't say we shouldn't be too worried. I said I, I wouldn't know <laughs> well, if the 400, so I said to you, I said, you have 403 new cases. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you whether I should be worried or happy because I don't know when the results were taken. But I'm saying that this 403 adds to your prevalence rate because the number of recoveries is not the rate of recovery is not as high as the rate of new cases being added. Mm. Every time we have a new rate of cases added after every three days, it's in the 200s or the 300s or the 100s. Yeah. The recoveries are jumping in the tens, mm -hmm. and your deaths are increasing in the ones. Do you follow me? Yeah. So your deaths are increasing by one, two, two, four, four like by a factor of one. Which, although it's important, we shouldn't be too good. Good. Worried your your, about your that. recoveries are jumping in the tens, yeah. but your case additions are in the hundreds. So it means that you are still growing on your curve. That's the first thing I've said. Yeah. Then I've said your people, yeah. although younger people also die. So I've said that should make you comfortable. Mm -hmm. Then I've said your case fatality rate is also lower than average. And I was going to give you some of the case fatality percentages just for your comparisons, Algeria's case fatality rate is 11.5% as of yesterday. Mm. 
okay? Morocco is 3.9%. That's 4%. Yeah. Case fatality. South Africa is 1.9%. That's almost 2%. Now, Ghana, Cameroon, before Ghana. Cameroon, 3.3%. These are African countries. Nigeria, 3.0%. Burkina Faso, 6.7%. Tunisia 4.1%, Niger 4.5%, Congo Kinshasa 6.1%, Somalia 4.8%, Sudan 7.5%, Mali 5.2%. Case fatality rate. Yeah. Tanzania 3.3%. And some of these countries include countries that got their first case much later than ours. Mm -hmm. So they're probably at an earlier stage of their curve. Most East African countries got have lower cases than West African countries. If you go to Kojo's map, West Africa and North, North Africa is the serious place. Yeah. West Africa follows. Now, case fatality in even East African countries on average is higher than ours, mm -hmm. right? Which means that they've, they've had a shorter time to incubate the disease, but they are dying more, okay? Liberia, 11.3% case fatality. Ghana is 1.0. And if you use today's numbers, yeah. it's even 0 0.8. Kenya case fatality. Kenya cases are not up to our cases. 3.9. Cote d'Ivoire, which is close to us, 1.1. So it's almost the same to ours, yeah. okay? Senegal case fatality one, similar to ours. A lot of people are praising Senegal. We have a similar case fatality rate. So you have to decide which statistic is important for what. Mm -hmm. Guinea, case fatality 0 0.5. 1,351 cases, only seven have died. That's pretty good, okay? So those are some of the things you should look out for in deducing. I suspect, and I've said this before, that the things I'm asking for yeah. The people advising the president have it, mm -hmm. but not all of that is being made public, mm -hmm. possibly because they don't think we can digest it or they don't think it's, they want to put all their tools of analysis to the general world to see. But I can bet my bottom dollar that they know the prevalence rate, they have the incidence, the they, they, they have, they do. because. They would not. I, I mean, the president is serious. <laughs> you, 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 get me? you can't go and just tell him stories. And they are experts. The guy leading the, yeah. the, 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 the Ghana response is a UN WHO level guy. Hmm. His credibility is at stake. So he's not going to just go and talk to the president who can answer stories and that he will listen. <laughs> so that's what gives but, me a bit but of comfort. Isn't it better to put out the information out there so people know exactly you know, what is going on and we can also advise ourselves accordingly? I, I think it's better to put out the information out there. And in putting out the information, look, even the basic things that are thrown out, if you tell us that the total number of cases is, say, 2,074, you give us the regional breakdowns, right? Um, recoveries, you do not say anything specifically about re uh, recoveries according to regions. Yeah. Deaths, you do not say anything specifically about deaths according to regions. Even um, information age of those who die. The age. Which is very important. There's actually a story on a the another website which I haven't verified. They are Meanwhile, claiming that a child has died from COVID-19 in Ghana. This hasn't been verified, but there's a story that's running. So his point is, if, for example, you give us Six, seventeen people have died. Mm -hmm. What's their age bracket? All the presidents keep saying is that they had underlying conditions. An underlying condition is a very loose um, way to put it. Okay, so it's. I, I think for the analysts, they are frustrated. Mm -hmm. Okay, those who are scrutinizing the numbers, they are they are quite frustrated that they don't have information to do their own. I'll give you an example. So, for example, Singapore. Mm -hmm. And the and invest in Singapore has modeled when their case will reach its peak because there's so much data they can. Yeah. How many investors in Ghana have given you a model for when COVID-19 will peak? Do you know any? Mm -mm. How many of them have told you what our maximum number of cases would be? They don't have the information. Do you get me? So it doesn't enrich the analysis. Yeah. So you can go to certain countries. You can have the Imperial College. London School of Tropical Medicine, people have done different models based on the data that's out there to give different scenarios, okay? Mm -hmm. I am sitting in Ghana, and the only serious analysis I have about when our cases will peak is from investing in Singapore. Mm -hmm. How is that even useful for mm -hmm. our context? Meanwhile, there are guys at Legon and Tech who, with more data, I mean, Abekan Kroma has tried. He's given us some yeah. data, but it's, it's not, we need to enrich the discussion mm -hmm. so that we, we will, you see, the more we put scientific analysis out there using different assumptions, the more people get a realistic understanding of the situation, so they behave. Don't forget that all the measures we put in place, whether lockdown, social distancing, or yeah. border closure, 
human conformity and behavior is an important determinant of the success or failure of that. Mm -hmm. So you don't just put numbers and say, the numbers say this. If you put in numbers and decide to go and play a football match tomorrow and go and do a big party, we've destroyed your numbers because mm -hmm. our behavior, yeah. which means that human behavior has been factored into the assumptions. So if the media, the science community, academia have better information, they can give the public a clearer sense of the reality mm. so that if we want people to wear masks, they will wear. Because we are telling them that, guys, if you don't wear your mask, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Other than that, we'll just be parroting what government says. Upon Krunka comes to stand there, uh, Kumi Abuaji comes to say what you say, then we say, okay, yeah, this is what they are saying. That's not our job. We are not, we are not, we are not uh, a sounding board. or exactly. uh, we, are, we are supposed to take the information, digest it, and question it. And then analyze it. That's what media and analysts are supposed to do. We are still waiting do. for so much details. Yes. So, could you, let, let's let's move on to you know something that I've really been thinking about. So, we recorded our first cases um, somewhere middle of March, I think 12 March or so. Yes. And today is the 30th of April. We seem to have done almost everything, including um, lockdown, including a ban on public gathering. We still have the ban on. Um, our borders, the yes. closure of our borders, borders still in place. We still have the ban on public gatherings still in place. We are in and out of lockdown. We may go to, if we go by what the president said, that if we notice that specific places will be danger zone, we'll still go back to lockdown. We are still climate high in numbers. Now the government says it's going to be building some hospitals. He mentioned 88 of those hospitals. I think that is fantastic news. But as far as the fight against COVID-19 is concerned, how practical is this? When are we going to be finishing this, you know, for it to come in support in the fight against COVID-19? Well, for the hospitals, the president was clear in the reason why he's going to build 88 district hospitals and six regional hospitals. He said that COVID-19 has exposed the health of the healthcare system, mm -hmm. if, if I'm to um, explain what he said, and that this is the time for us to ensure that we make the right investments into healthcare. So we are going to build eight, eight district hospitals and six um, regional hospitals. Mm -hmm. And he said that the district hospitals would have about 100 beds capacity. Yeah. Now, there's no way that the hospitals can be completed any moment from now for us to use in the fight against COVID-19. But if I understood him very well, the, the, the reality of our healthcare system has now hit home. So we need to make the right investments. And for me, I think it was a good call that he made. Mm -hmm. Because look, if you do a geographical analysis of health facilities in this country, the inequality is staggering. Mm -hmm. Okay, over 50% of the proper facilities are between Ashanti region and Greater Accra region alone. Yeah. Over fifty percent of your doctors are within Ashanti region and Greater Accra region alone. In fact, this morning um, we read a story on radio um, which quoted the medical director of the OA Regional Hospital that look, they needed six hundred staff members. They have only two hundred staff members. Mm. So the new hospital they are working with is understaffed. And for any country to develop, we need to see to healthcare. Mm. And we need to ensure that every district capital, every region has a proper healthcare facility and a proper school. Mm -hmm. Those are two key things. Yeah. Now the world is moving from healthcare preventive, from, from curative healthcare into preventive. But Ghana is in a position where even the, the curative, we don't have enough resources. Yeah. So you put them in place, then you, you trumpet the preventive, and then you get proper education. So I think it's, it's, it's a good way to go. Mm. But Whilst we are preparing to build hospitals, we've also seen historical occurrences of these projects started and not finished on time, mm -hmm. no proper project uh, management, and then in the end we end up having cost overruns. Yeah. If we are really going to do this, we must put in place everything that we need to put in place to ensure that we design functional hospitals, we build cost-effective hospitals, and they are constructed and completed in time to be used for the people. Yeah. And whilst we build the hospitals, we also look at the software. Because mm -hmm. the hospitals will be the hardware. We look at the software. What do I mean by the software? If you build eight, eight hospitals and six regional district hospitals and six regional hospitals and you don't have staff to man them, mm -hmm. you've not done anything. Yeah. We've seen, same with um, 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 Y Hospital, we've seen with UG, uh, UGMC. UGMC. 
where we built a magnificent facility, but we do not have enough specialists to man the facility. So what we decided to do was to open it in phases. And then the interim management were trying to poach specialists from the other hospitals. So whilst we build the facilities, we, we also need to invest in healthcare education mm. to ensure that we have enough doctors, nurses, pharmacists, um, psychiatrists, pediatricians, whatever the profession is, to man these facilities so that once they are done, we can optimally benefit from them. If we don't do that, we've lost. And then the existing facilities, we need to ensure that they are also appropriately resourced. The mm. ones in operation and the ones being built, abandoned, behind shadow, we need to make sure that we do everything we can to get them also on stream mm. to serve the people. Because look, we are in a country that has a bed capacity of just about 20,000. Mm -hmm. Last time we looked at the estimate. These new hospitals could bring up to about 9,000 more beds to their capacity, which would take us to say some 30,000 plus the existing abandoned in court hospitals. If we do not invest appropriately in these facilities, we are still going to see the no bed syndrome. Mm -hmm. We are still going to see the major hospitals being overcrowded and, and stressed. You go to Convanoche now, Kolibu, Ridge Hospital and all these facilities. Every other facility is sending their patients there yeah. because you do not have enough dis uh, hospitals in the regions and the districts that can take care of patients. But you must re re relieve them of the stress so that they can take care of those they have very well. We do not want to see um, um, mothers in labor give, giving birth on the floor. We do not want to see people who we must give health care to in, res in a respectful and a proper way. People just dying because they couldn't get beds. We do not want to see that. And sometimes people say, oh, but this district has a hospital. Why can't this district move there? Our road infrastructure, 30% good, 40% fair, 30% bad. By the time you call an ambulance to move in to get somebody to a different facility, the time factor even yeah, affects the outcome. So yeah. we need to invest and we need to ensure we do it right. And one thing we should all, all also think about is that if you have public hospitals in certain places, it's improved access and quality. Mm. Okay. Because in a lot of the rural areas where you have these private hospitals and all of these, sometimes we see incidents of quack doctors and all these things happening in those places. But you are sure that if it's a public hospital, the standard of care would be a bit it's higher. Quality, so, yeah. so we should all be following the, this promise and ensure about um, hospitals and who built more hospitals and whether we need 94 hospitals has quickly overridden some of the more pressing issues of testing capacity, um, what is our basic reproductive number, we don't even know it, um, how close are we to getting a vaccine. We are not interested in those things. They are too hard. We just want the one that we can compare records. It's, a, it's, mm. it's part of our challenge as a country yeah. because as we sit here, we are waiting for something to develop. In fact, the only way to reduce a disease prevalence and win, if you are not going to continue lockdown and social distancing to get a vaccine, yeah. we don't know what progress we've made in that. And nobody seems to be interested in that as much. Mm. I've, I keep saying every day, we don't know. Look, UK's basic productive number is 0 0.7. Yeah. At the beginning, it was 3. It's kind of 0 0.7. Now, they are thinking of lifting their lockdown. We don't know our number. Mm -hmm. Yet nobody's interested in that. We are interested in the hospital because that one is our politics. So let me go there. And I'm not blaming you. It's all of us. We like those things. Where we are now. Maybe because we don't have this and we. No, it's because. You see, that, you see, the, 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 you see, they also have to look at you see, our, how we're our, going to our, our politics likes the externals. Mm -hmm. As we sit here, what will save your country is your testing capacity mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Okay. But we are not even discussing where the investment into the labs are. Mm -hmm. Because a hospital is easy to do campaign with. Yeah. So whether it's NDC or MPP, they like hospital because you can say we built, in fact, you can even paint the front of a hospital and build the roof and then leave the back empty. People <laughs> will still vote for you. So we need, to, we need to, yes, build hospitals, but also move into more nuanced discussion. Because as we sit here, our hospitals are not even overcrowded. That doesn't mean we have enough hospitals. Yeah. But your problem now is that you don't even have your test results. You've taken samples three weeks, the results are not in. You're not interested in that. You're interested in which one is the hospital. As we are sitting here, if you look at the way the disease is being managed and people are bringing isolation centers, a hospital's existence simpliciter 
it's not the most important issue. Mm -hmm. It's about having lab technicians, having doctors, and all. Hospitals are also important. Yeah. But it's very easy to. We don't like the complicated discussion about. But you see, I'm okay, coming. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm doing a commentary on yeah. Ghanaian society. Mm -hmm. We don't like a complicated discussion about the things that really matter now. Mm -hmm. We want the one that can easily help us to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think that going for it, we should be more rigorous in doing things that count immediately. That doesn't mean that what Kujo said is not true. That. You need a hospital in each district. But I'm just fascinated that that issue has risen quickly to become the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, in fact, when on Sunday we were on TV and the president announced the hospitals, people started tagging us. Hey, you people, you did the hospital thing. Charlie, what is the president building the hospital? Hey, hospital. Okay, fine. So let's do hospital. Mm. President says he's going to build 88 hospitals. One district, one hospital. Nobody in their right mind will argue with that. Yeah. The question, though, is that of all the things that you want to invest your money in within a year, mm -hmm. looking at the fact that your budget has been thrown out of gear, your cocoa, your gold, uh, and your oil resources, revenues, you don't know how much is going to come, yeah. tax is going to come down, business have collapsed. Looking at the fact that your assumptions about your economy have been kicked out of gear, it's promising to build 90, uh, 88 hospitals in a year the best thing you can do. Mm. That's question one. Yeah. Do you know the cost of these hospitals? Do you determine the cost before you determine the time or you determine the time before the cost? Mm -hmm. Do you know where the funding source is coming from? Because we've already established that one of the reasons why projects delay is that the funding source is not properly, clearly, um, it's not a sustainable funding mm -hmm. source. So for when DOG is doing something, a road, the Achimata to Kumasi Road, it took over seven years was well, have taken two years because the funding source wasn't guaranteed you need to ask yourself these questions we need to learn from our mistakes i think it's great to take advantage of an opportunity to expand infrastructure but the devil is in the detail yeah okay so the technocrats around the president should help us by putting more structure into some of these things okay telling us you build 94 hospitals is a good idea but do you have to do all in a year exactly looking at where you are mm -hmm. and we're doing all in a year make you pandemic resilient is that so if you have a hundred seats and you are spending how much of that will go into training doctors and specialists how much of that will go into boosting your lab capacity into building hospitals and making them available you need to have a wide so it's you need a more broad nuanced discussion exactly okay but in ghana we like political uh how do you call it statements which everybody can understand so that we would Slogan, yeah. yeah so so it's like and i have not you see don't get me i'm not saying it's not good to do one d one f one hospital one district two but where we have gotten to, what COVID-19 is teaching us is that those solutions will not stand the test of time because COVID doesn't respect political slogan. Exactly. It doesn't respect your grant. It, it respects your attention to minding the detail of science. And my question actually is, we are recording huge numbers every day. Now we are jumping only a few days ago. Today we have jumped like 400 and something. And we need solutions now. And we are thinking of what we are going to be doing, planning like in the whole... No, no, but no, Freeman, I think that one, I, it's, I don't think... So let me just, I'm not saying that. No, no, don't no, do I'm long not saying, plan. No, you, don't, you don't get me. Uh -huh. I am not talking about you. I am questioning that whole um, thing we want to do, that we want to build a now, my question right now, Kojo, if you understand me, that we are growing, we have growing cases now. So what do we have to do now? It's fantastic to build hospitals. But in the meantime, if we wake up tomorrow and we have about 400 or 500 people in critical condition, how do we handle that as a country? Well, th that's why um, we've set out some facilities for now to deal with those ones. So they are the temporary solutions that we have to deal with the immediate the East Bank of Ghana Hospital, the Elwak uh, makeshift facility, the um, CEO's network are also building something which should be done by next week. Mm -hmm. So we have some facilities. So we have the temporary solutions to do with this. You and see, earlier we were talking so, about data, yeah. Prima, and we're all not happy that we are not seeing the data. Yeah. But if you look at the data available to the Ghana Health Service, this thing has traveled to a lot of districts within the regions that have recorded cases. And what is so, obvious so me, is that... So let me uh -huh. ask again. So like Bernard was saying, this is where we stand now. Is building hospitals now the solution in handling this? Because the president came to announce this to us when he was updating no, but us. To be fair, he didn't pitch it as a solution. He didn't pitch it as a solution to the problem. He's saying that 
where we've gotten to, yes. the thing has exposed, it has exposed the weaknesses. The weaknesses. So, so let's do, and I say it's great. Okay. But I'm just saying so, that. So, so let me ask my question. Yes. So it is fantastic, but we are going to be building 88 hospitals in a year, in a time where we are fighting a terrible pandemic. Is mm. this where our attention should be? I don't know if you get where I'm coming from. Should I, we, for instance, not be equipping or reinvesting much more into the hospitals we have if we have to make some makeshift isolation centers everywhere? For now, I, I, should we not be looking at that? I, I, I get your, your 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 question, and I get your concern. But you see, in in solving a national health crisis and planning for the future, because nobody knew when COVID nineteen was going to come, yeah. and nobody knows what is going to come next. Mm. So, if COVID nineteen has exposed you in a certain way, you should start asking yourself, what if something else comes tomorrow? And what if this thing spreads to all the corners of the country? Mm. Do you have enough resources to deal with this? Yeah. So, I, I see the government in this particular case not thinking rectilinearly like mm -hmm. thinking in a straight line but thinking across to ensure that let's do with this or the exposure we've seen let's fix it for example we said that COVID-19 has exposed the fundamentals of our economy yeah so now a lot of the conversations are now let's put our money in local companies so when COVID-19 happened PPE we are using local companies GRA is stepping up to produce their own um, sanitizers, other people are stepping up. So you may see things being done to deal with COVID-19, COVID but the lessons and the things we've seen would also um, push us to put other structures in place, support our, our nation. Mm beyond today. So All that's right. what I'm seeing um, the okay, government so trying to do. I can give you 30 seconds. Yeah, if they can do it, great. Um, mm -hmm. All I'll say is um, it has to be part of a broader strategy. Mm -hmm which also takes into cognizance our priorities based on our limitations in budget. Mm. And I hope the other people in government are also helping the president to align this vision. Mm. So finance is there, social protection is there, and health. It's not just because we have a health emergency. If that is happening, I'm very clear that they will execute it. Because I'm not sure the finance minister will have all the money to give for all the 88 this year. Mm. That's what I'm sure he, don't, he doesn't. All right. Thank you very much, Kuju, and thank you very much, Bernard. So you have been watching a special and listening to a special coverage on COVID-19. I'm very sorry we couldn't take your messages today. We'll do so tomorrow. So this is where we stand now, case count 2074. So you may want to take all the safety precautions seriously. You never know who has it and who you will be meeting or dealing with. My name is Premier Dunyame. My guests were Kuju Akutu Bateng, who is head of New Media and also uh, um, research and a team member of the City Breakfast Show and Bernard Abler. He is general manager City FM City TV host Point of View on City TV and City Breakfast Show on City FM 97.3. Thank you very much. My name is Premier Dunyame. Enjoy the rest of our programs.